I think you're one of the somewhat unsung heroes of our poetry tradition in South Africa, and I'm just, I really hope that um, the uh, cosmonaut spirit in heaven is going to shoot you into the stratosphere of stardom where you belong. Cosmonaut Stewart in Heaven is obviously more focused on space flight, um, but as I think you've said already, descent and activism, the elements of those things are, are, are very much present. And I, you have two dedications. One of them is dedicated to all who suffered ridicule, house arrest, detention, or concentration camp for their commitment to, astronomic, to astronomy or astronautics. You know, it surprised me a bit given the widespread enthusiasm for scientific progress. Um, can you expand on that? Um, yes. Uh, it was Copernicus who was too frightened to publish for 30 years after inventing his theory for fear of ridicule, which he wrote about. It was Galileo who spent the last decade of his life in house arrest under sentence of the Italian Inquisition. Werner von Braun was detained in the SS cells in Stettin and the kangaroo court started uh, a life and death trial of him and he was of course the father of German and the United States rocketry mm. and Sergei Korolev, the father of Soviet and Russian space flight was jailed in the Kolyma concentration camp, which had the highest death rate of any concentration camp, and was later transferred to an indoors concentration camp, which served as the model for Alexander Solonitsyn writing The First Circle. So, then uh, Qian Shusen, the father of the Chinese spaceflight program, was hounded and harassed under McCarthyism and was under house arrest in California and later was denounced in the great cultural Chinese proletarian revolution and only escaped a grim fate because no less than Zhou Enlai sent an army detachment to guard his home. <laughs> but you know, it, it's, um, I did say that there's a political scientist in, in the room as well as a poet uh, and an astronautics buff and each and every element in this dedication uh, is linked to something very specific. Uh, would you mind reading The Unstarry Messenger? It's on page five if, if you want to follow it. I should explain that Galileo wrote a newsletter called The Starry Messenger. Oh. Hmm. And so this poem is called The Unstarry Messenger. <laughs> it's hard to live up to being a legend when your back aches and your sight's failing and you only wanted to be a telescope salesman, not a martyr. Discovering spots on the sun, phases of Venus, moons orbiting Jupiter, measuring mountains on the moon as low as the mountains in Italy between university and Inquisition. 1616, news communique. Vatican bans Earth from orbiting around the sun. Galileo Galilei's scope couldn't see the day it shattered the crystalline spheres of the heavens will be the day Vatican politics shatter all over you. For 206 years, the hard porn of Dr. Pohl and Professor Pisa rotted on the index. 1822, newsflash. Vatican unbans Earth from orbiting around the sun. Starry-eyed messenger bearing the news, discoverers are never ahead of their time. The establishment is behind the times. 1992, news bite. Vatican apologizes to Galileo. After 13 years of appeal hearings, the Politburo of the Vatican Central Committee pronounced during the Inquisition's proceedings Grave violations of Catholic legality brought canon law into disrepute and rules. Galileo Galilei is posthumously rehabilitated 
from false charges of Copernicanism, Protestantism, Marxism, masturbation, and then letting your telescope eat meat on Fridays. <laughs> Keith, uh, you used to do a lot of performance poetry at, at political rallies. Um, and there's this uh, broad sense of humor here. This, this, uh, do you think that influenced your, your writing of these poems? Yes, there's nothing like being on a stage in front of a stadium of 5,000 people to learn that they start, your audience walks away unless you keep them thoroughly entertained. And so the opening poem in my collection uh, is called True Confessions, who really gave Nick Copernicus the idea that Ptolemy and the church had got it all wrong. One moonful night, Copernicus' lover whispered, darling, the earth moved. Part of our, dis our discussion has reflected this tension between uh, reactionary forces, between um, progressive forces. Uh, and I I'm not saying these forces don't exist or weren't there. But, you know, what you write about is shaped by how you think um, and how you configured as a personality and your life experiences. Um, this tension between progressive and reactionary forces. Was this forged in your struggle poetry and then transferred into your astronautic poetry, perhaps? Yes. Uh, of course, after Galileo's time, uh, there was less resistance <coughs> from the establishment to astronomy and astronautics. But then again, Sergei Korolev was thrown into concentration camp on the specific charge of sabotaging the Soviet defense budget by trying to hijack it for spaceflight instead of making weapons. And of course, spaceflight is a struggle against gravity. It's a struggle against the white-hot shockwave of re-entry. So there's uh, huge forces that you've got to contend with. I'm going to read this because it's a lengthy question. I would say that your knowledge of the history of space flight is encyclopedic, and it shows, obviously. The poems have your trademark sharpness and compression, your bright imagery and so on. But you bolted that onto this very, very big uh, armature of knowledge and, and, and reference. There's a depth of knowledge that not everybody possesses. So there must have been some tension between flooding the text with um, footnotes explaining everything and over-explaining and between being obscure on the, the other. How did you manage that one? When my first collection came out 29 years ago, Peter Horn teased me that I didn't have footnotes, I had feet notes because there were so many, which... On looking back, I don't regret because nobody today knows those acronyms of hundreds of little organizations of the 1980s. But today, we are in the epoch of Wikipedia and Google, where the curious reader can look up nearly everything. So what I did was I started off by under-referencing, and I gave copies of my TypeScript to five literary friends who had no science and engineering background at all to read through. And I let them ask me, what is this, what is this referred to, to guide me as to I needed to add more references. Then I went to a reputable publisher, Colleen Higgs of Mojaji, and she hired a freelance editor who also sent queries about what is this referring to. Mm -hmm. So I added footnotes to top it up to the level that they're in the collection. Uh, Keith, would you mind reading We Who Are Not Angels? It's on page 37 if you want to, to follow. <clears throat> we Who Are Not Angels. We who are not angels, nor born with wings, nor tithe of virtue for ascension to heaven. We had only slide rules, now software. We who turn equation into turbo pump, who craft metal 
to take flight. We who gave birth to the impossible, a pulse of fire soaring, a glint of light. Uh, to me, that is as is, is beautiful as it is, as it is simple and, and clear. It's, it's a lovely poem. There's another poem I want you to read. It's on page 29 and it's written in Chinese. <laughs> Could you tell us the story of that translation? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> when I wrote the poem, I mentioned this to my colleague, Yulene Pretorius, who lectures in international relations. And she said from her Cambridge days, she's got a Chinese friend living in Taiwan who could do the translation. So I was very fortunate to, to get it done beautifully. She was so uh, sophisticated that she was concerned with the word madness has got negative energy in Chinese, whereas the previous word used about rage had positive energy and was a lot of thought in the translation. And I sprung the poem and its translation as a surprise on two delegations of visiting Chinese government officials who came to UWC who were quite stunned by it. Oh, really? I also have a Hebrew translation of a poem because of its topic. Uh, it's an elegy written to Ilan Ramon, the Israeli uh, astronaut who died on the space shuttle Columbia when it disintegrated. Um, how did you spring it on the Chinese? Um, <laughs> did you? You obviously didn't read it. Did you? Uh, what I, form did you? I, I gave them a photocopy of it in English and Chinese. Oh, I see. They all read the Chinese, but they looked most impressed. Oh, good. Well, that's that's great. Would you mind reading the English on page twenty-eight? <clears throat> The poem is dedicated to Qian Shu Sen, uh, who started off <coughs> his career as a rocket engineer in California, inventing <coughs> cybernetics in the 1960s and 50s, was persecuted and put under virtual house arrest under McCarthyism, and finally escaped to China, where he later uh, all got denounced in the great cultural proletarian revolution and was only just rescued from a very ugly fate. And of course, a uh, classical name for China was the Celestial Empire, and that double meaning begs a poet to use it. So it's called the Celestial Empire. The great ocean, two shores, two realms. The western shore, jade. The eastern shore, Coca-Cola above the realm that calls. On the eastern shore, you, Father, birthed the rocket. Their door that clanged behind you was not lacquered in vermilion. On the western shore, renaissance of flying dragons. You, midwife, let fly a new moon. You, bamboo, too often battered by madness of typhoons. Feng Jishen smiles with Qian Shu Sen to see the Fifth Academy, the Seventh Ministry, fly Dong Fang Hong and Shenzhou, bull from Ji Quan, a silk road to the sky. Yeah, that's very beautiful. And there are notes on this one that explain uh, certain of the references. And I, I didn't get the, the door that clanged behind you was not lacquered in vermilion until, of course, your introduction just now. But um, um, it's hauntingly beautiful, as I said, but it brings to light, to some extent, the, the cosmopolitan nature of this project. You know, elsewhere in the, the um, uh, I said, the cosmopolitan scope of your poetic history of space flight. Uh, I wanted to repeat that. So you've got Chinese astronomers, Japanese space ports, the contributions of thinkers from various European uh, countries. So seen through the lens of your collection, it seems like the, you know, we, we I think, brought up on this um, binary Cold War narrative, uh, which is a very oversimplified version of what actually happened. Mm. Yes, for <coughs> us English speakers, we were brought up on the Reader's Digest and Time magazine, where the Soviet Union, China and communism were evil, and NATO was freedom. And it turned out reality was slightly more complex. 
uh, the reference to the door lacquered in vermilion is that that was the classical painting of a door of a mandarin in the Chinese empire. And of course, the door of his prison cell in the USA was not painted in vermilion. In the Soviet Union in China, we had the unprecedented allocation of resources towards space flight, which made some great achievements, the first Sputnik, the first Yuri Gagarin, and all these things. So reality was a bit more complex than the Reader's Digest taught us. Yeah, and also, of course, the first rockets uh, were Chinese, weren't they? Yes, the, uh, uh, 800 years ago, 1,000 yes, years ago, yes. gunpowder rockets. Yes. So I'm going to turn to page 77, where I'm going to read something. Oh, yes, what I wanted to say, uh, when I was a kid, I used to read popular mechanics in the school library. And I discovered I can find popular mechanics uh, on the interwebs, of course. And I discovered the other day that uh, UFOs are not UFOs anymore. They are UAPs, <laughs> unidentified aerial phenomena. So you've learned something. I suppose more syllables, much better. Um, on 77, you've mentioned Peter Horn. Um, he passed away not very long ago, a very respected poet of uh, many years standing. And he writes this. Uh, Keith uses this inscription to the section called Sky Beyond Sky. Trust your body, it needs to fly. Your body knows what to do, it is wind against wind. Cloud over cloud, sky beyond sky. And it's from a poem called Wind Surfers Do It Standing Up. <laughs> Which might have been an influence on your title, I don't know. Yes, that's where it was inspired from. Yes. Um, so I, I think you see hope in this grand project of, of uh, astral navigation, a kind of human transcendence. Or is it simply a history of inventions, albeit very impressive ones? I, I think humanity has always <clears throat> had an urge to explore the unknown in them since the Stone Age. Even at school, we were taught about Magellan's expedition to circumnavigate the world. We heard about the Egyptian king hiring a Phoenician sailors to sail, circumnavigate the whole of Africa. We were not taught that the Chinese Admiral Zheng He sailed west to Malindi in Kenya. And we weren't taught about Leif Erikson exploring Greenland and Canada. And of course, there were phenomenal Polynesian navigators over great expanses of the Pacific uh, Ocean, navigating long before GPS was there to assist anyone. So this is a natural extension of that impulse yes. off the planet. I hate to tell you this, but I discovered, I learned about Leif Erikson in the Reader's Digest. Um, Good for him. The, the um, selection and arrangement of poems in many collections is pretty arbitrary, I suppose, because poems are very subjective. But there's a very logical sequence here. Can you speak to the design of the collection? Yes. Um, the first section in the collection <coughs> is called Making Space because it's about the scientists who literally made the way we conceive of the universe today, from Copernicus to Einstein, from an Earth-centered astrology to a Sun-centered astronomy. Then the next section is called Making Out, with a fun and double meaning, and is dedicated to those inventors and engineers who founded the rockets and the space flight, uh, spaceports and cosmodromes that we've uh, got today. The third section is called Getting High because just like the hippies of the 1960s, it's about people and satellites being launched into orbit around the Earth. The next section is called Phases of the Moon because of course I've got love poems which follow the classical symbols of the moon and stars in it and there has to be poems celebrating Project Apollo and 12 Americans landing on the moon. And the last section 
is an imaginary flight through the solar system from the Sun to Pluto called Sky Beyond Sky, where I was inspired by all those images from the Voyager and Pioneer space probes showing cloud layer above cloud layer on Jupiter and Saturn in particular. So that's the arrangement of the collection. So it's as, as shot through with uh, thought as each individual poem. Um, you've mentioned that they were written over a number of years. Uh, does this reflect this trajectory, project your own growth as a poet? I think you can see this. The earliest poems uh, I wrote in this collection uh, was the original uh, draft of my elegy to the astronaut who died in Challenger blowing up in 1986. They vanished, became sky, a rain of metal tears upon the land. Writhing, their contrail became a cenotaph, a wreath we laid on our voyage to the worlds. So I started off these poems with tragedy, but later poems have got irony, poignancy, and a bit more uh, metaphorical in their uh, growth. And you left out parody. Yes, <laughs> the, 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 the satire is there throughout the whole Yes, way. there is 